On today's episode of Ray Ora's Guide to Workplace Conduct, <laughs> we're going to talk about Channing Tatum may just actually appear as Gambit in the upcoming Deadpool. We're going to discuss that. Apparently, Gladiator 2 is now rap filming, and Paramount execs seem to love it so much, they're planning a larger-than-normal marketing campaign for it. Hey, did your mom and dad ever watch that show Bewitched? Well, apparently it's coming back. They're going to be rebooting it, and Dune 2 had its full premiere, and the reactions are like nothing we've seen before. That and a whole few things more. The John Cabe Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, the John Campus Show podcast, coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio, brought to you in part by our friends at Mint Mobile. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and all sorts of good stuff, not just giving you our opinions, but also giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same, maybe even different than ours. Uh, joining me in studio today, we got Ray Ora. Hey. hey. Jonathan Voiko's here. I'm ready. Chris Carr is here on Friday. Hey, everybody. My name is, of course, John Campion. <laughs> this is the John Campion Show, and we are so glad that you decided to make this show part of your day. All right. Here's how today's show is going to go, guys. We're going to start off by talking about those predetermined topics that I listed off. Then we're going to take your live comments and questions. If you guys have a thought, comment, question, observation for the show, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature and send that in. Uh, they'll, they're open right now. They'll be open probably for a little bit longer. And then uh, we'll read those off when we get to the second part of the show. Okay. With that down, guys. Let's get things started on this Friday, shall we? If you guys remember... Back in 2013, 2014, Channing Tatum, a guy who I once believed and said publicly was the worst actor in Hollywood getting work, eventually just kept working and working at his craft and trying to get better and getting coaching and blah, blah, blah. And eventually got to the point where I started to really enjoy watching Ted Channing Tatum and stuff. I really like Channing Tatum now. <coughs> Well, he wanted to be Gambit. <laughs> and I remember when that first came out, a lot of people were like, oh, come on, that would be dumb. But I was like, you know what? He could easily pull off all the physicality. He can pull off the Cajun. I think he'd be really good. I think he'd be quite a good Gambit. And then it became official. They announced at Cinema or Comic-Con, I should say, they had the big Fox panel with all the X-Men and... Deadpool and all that kind of stuff, they brought out Channing Tatum and they announced that Channing Tatum was going to be Gambit. And he was so excited. A lot of people, there's Ryan Reynolds with his hands on his shoulders and Hugh Jackman right behind him. You can see, obviously, Channing's pretty happy, excited about it. Here's the funny thing about dreams, kids. Dreams die. Because not long after that, Fox got bought by Disney. And Disney said, not interested in uh, in Gambit. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And that was the end of that. Now, fast forward a little bit more. Channing Tatum and Ryan Reynolds maintain a really cool, tight friendship. This was actually them backstage at Comic-Con. Of course, Channing Tatum had a movie-stealing role in Free Guy with uh, Ryan Reynolds. They, they've done stuff together. And so whispers lately have been going around, not necessarily connected to Deadpool, but there have been whispers going around that Marvel may actually be looking at bringing in Channing Tatum's Gambit. Not that that's been confirmed by any official source, not that that even is a, is a super reliable thing, but as I'm telling you, constantly the whispers have been going around. And then Deadpool came around. Deadpool 3 got announced. There's going to be a lot of different cameos. So whispers continued and persisted that we might see Channing Tatum in there. Well, now, according to outlets like Screen Rant and, and others, people are starting to think that this is actually really going to happen. As a matter of fact, if I scroll down here, there are a bunch of people who say, if you watch the trailer carefully, of course, there's this shot of Wolverine as Patch, that when you see the dealer's hand moves, there are people who 100% think that's Gambit dealing the cards. Now, this would be a little bit reminiscent of that Wolverine uh, origin, X-Men Origins Wolverine movie, because in that movie we saw 
Wolverine at a poker table with uh, Gambit. Or they go and find Gambit at a poker table. So there's that. And look, the only reason I bring this up, I'm not saying I believe that the dealer across from Wolverine here is Gambit. But the reason I simply bring it up here is because, like I said, some outlets are now starting to run with this. I I have no idea about the veracity of these things, but I have heard from several people that this is something that really could happen. Uh, again, I've heard nothing reliable that says it is, but this continues to be the whispers. So the question becomes, would people be okay with seeing a Channing Tatum gambit? And I just don't know because, Ray, you can look this up for me, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know how old Channing Tatum is now. Now, if I do my math right, he's 10 years older than he was when they announced that he was going to be Gambit. He is 43. <clears throat> he's 43. Okay, you know what? That's not bad. If Hugh Jackman can still be Wolverine at 55, yeah. Channing Tatum can be uh, can be ga Gambit at 43, I guess. And we're talking about a cameo here, <clears throat> right? So well, who knows? I, I, can't, I can't believe that. Okay, let's go with the assumption just for a moment, okay? For the sake of the discussion, that the whispers are true, which I am not saying they are. But let's assume for the sake of the discussion that the whispers are true and he's going to pop up in there. I can't imagine it would be a significant role. There's, there's, All right. This is Deadpool and Wolverine. It'll be a Krasinski thing. Krasinski. It, it, yes, it would probably be more along the lines of a John Krasinski thing. And you know what? It would be consistent with that. Because that's what Kevin Feige did in Multiverse of Mad. Say, look, we're not going to have John Krasinski as Mr. Fantastic. But because a lot of the fans would just love to see it, you know what, for Multiverse of Madness, why don't we just throw him in there as a treat to the fans? Following that precedent, I could absolutely see a Kevin Feige saying, well, you know what, we're not going to do Channing Tatum as Gambit. But in a Deadpool 3, maybe that's a place where we could just kind of scratch that itch and kind of have him pop up in there. I mean, let's face it, Marvel's done a little bit of that stuff of like, People talking about somebody in a certain role, okay, we'll give you a little taste of it. And and they've done that. That could be something they do here. And if they do it, that's fine. My only caveat is if you're gonna have, if you're gonna have a Gambit cameo, make sure it's for a reason. Make sure it's for a purpose. Right? One of the things that I liked about the cameos that we had in Doctor Strange and Multiverse of Madness is they played a functional part of the story. The, all those, like the Illuminati and all that kind of stuff showing up those played a part in the progression of the story. So as long as it's not just Gambit coming out, you know, hey, mon ami, and, and slapping on the back, saying, I got to catch a cab, bye, and, and then that's it, <laughs> then it's pointless. But if you short cameo, sure, make it something that moves along. And you know what? I think I'd be down for that, and I think a lot of people would be down for that. Again, if it's true, and I don't think it is, but who knows at this point. Chris, so... I guess there's a couple of questions to be asked here. Number one, do you believe he will show up as, as Gambit? Number two, do you think we'd want to see him show up as Gambit at this point? What do you think about it? Yes and yes. I absolutely <laughs> think he's going to be in this. Again, when we keep talking about this movie, Ryan Reynolds is bringing all his buddies along. Especially if it is going to be packed with all these different folks in here. Uh, sad day to be Taylor Kitsch, I guess. Because, you know, I'm sure he would like another go at being uh, at Gambit. But Channing Tatum never got his day in the sun. He got to go to Comic-Con and that was it. We never saw him again in this kind of stuff. I think it'd be wonderful to have him in the mix. He's got great comedic chops. He really does. He's so, so funny. And he's able to make fun of himself very well. And I think he'd be able to play this role really well, too. Gambit is a very beloved character, though. Yeah. So I agree with you on I don't want it to just be oh what's up i'm wearing a trench coat deuces uh oh watch uh, out right yeah i don't want that <laughs> oh, for so geez. many reasons then i want to have a good meaningful moment oh that what picture is, that is like chris carr fan fiction right there what <laughs> who is she supposed to be what face is that what actor is that supposed to be hmm. i don't know i don't know familiar. who that is yeah. it looks like someone like AI'd Shigo instead of Rogue <laughs> from Kim Possible. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I just want it to be a, a meaningful performance if he's in there. But I, I really would like him to get to do this. Look at how happy he was. Look at him wearing his little shirt. Oh, he was thrilled. Yeah. And, and and he was heartbroken. I mm -hmm. saw an interview with him where talking about when he talking about when they found out that he wasn't going to be it anymore. He was devastated. I know. And those were the good old days when Stan Lee could be at the Comic Con panels and stuff oh. like that. And you could go say hey to him yep. and he'd be so cool. Yep. It was the best. Those were the days. Guys, question is for you. 
What do you think? Do you think we could see Gambit, played by Channing Tatum, pop up into Deadpool 3? And if you're going to do something like that, a Deadpool and Wolverine movie is probably the place to do it. Do you think people will get into it? Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comments and let us know your thoughts. All right. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? The path of Gladiator 2 has been a really interesting one. They first kind of floated the idea of Gladiator 2 years ago. I think I was still at Collider at the time. And the concept of Gladiator 2 at that point was, the gods have decided that Maximus's time was not yet done and they were going to send Maximus back to Earth, to which everybody did a heavy set of eye rolls and nobody wanted to see that. And then we all thought it was gone. Well, then a couple of years ago, we started to hear that they were going to mount a Gladiator 2 anyway, but it wasn't going to be with that the Return of Maximus storyline. It was going to be something else. Then we started hearing, you know what? I think they're going to do it about Lucius, the young kid in Gladiator, the Emperor's nephew, and it's going to be now about him all grown up. Bring back some of the original characters. Denzel Washington's going to be in it. Yeah. I think Pedro Pascal is in this. Um, of course he is. Uh, the, the kid, is. the other kid who's uh, Eddie, Eddie, the kid who's in Fantastic Four now is oh, yeah. also in this. Isn't it Paul Mescal? Mescal. I think Paul Mescal is in it as well, yeah. but, I, but I think uh, the kid oh. who plays, I could be wrong about that, but I thought I heard okay. he was in it. Anyway, I don't have the cast list uh, in front Quinn of me. Something Quinn is Eddie Munson. And so, so here's the Joseph thing. Quinn. Joseph Quinn. Joseph Quinn. Here's the thing, though, about Ridley Scott. He's not any good anymore. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm going to bring up a list here of uh, Ridley Scott's... Not the list. <laughs> the list? <laughs> You're on the list! All right. Of Ridley Scott and the last number of movies that he has directed. All right? Napoleon. Woof. House of Gucci. I didn't mind House of Gucci, but a lot of people didn't like it. Somebody sitting across from me really didn't like it. Mm -hmm. The Jonathan. Last Duel. <laughs> Before that was The Last Duel. That was all right, though. That one. I, but... I didn't like The yeah, Last Duel. Yeah, but then Duel. he also blamed audiences, <clears throat> being like, well, millennials, millennials oh, don't like that, cinema. Yeah. Yeah. The big millennial thing. I, I didn't like that at all. Yeah. Then he did All the Money in the World, which... Can't make a good movie. I, I didn't think that movie was bad. It certainly had Christopher Plummer Christopher stepping Plummer's in. Christopher Plummer's incredible. Yeah. yeah, Christopher Plummer got an Academy had Award nomination for it, actually. re shoot yeah. half of it. Alien Covenant, I did not like. And then you got to go all the way back to 2015 when he did The Martian. That yeah. was great. <laughs> okay? That was great. The best movie ever. Then before that, he did Exodus, Gods and Kings. Then before that, he did maybe his worst film, The Counselor. What? Then before that... He did Prometheus, which is divided. Some people really, really love Prometheus. I, like I, I did not like Prometheus, but that's me. Before that, he did Russell Crowe's Robin Hood, which was not any good. And then you got to go back to 2007 for American Gangster, which was pretty great. Yeah. I loved America. But listen, six out of his last seven films have just not been all that good. I mean, listen, Ridley Scott, make no mistake, is a first ballad Hall of Famer when it comes to the the uh, pantheon of great directors that we've had in Hollywood. No doubt. That part, his legacy is already completely secure. But, let, I mean, let's be honest. He hasn't been killing it lately. Again, I'm not trying to mean. I'm, look, am I wrong? Am I wrong in saying he has not been killing it lately? Come on. Let's be honest here. So, I, I haven't really known what to think about a Gladiator 2 and the whole idea about uh, a remounting it. But... Me and a couple of other, well, one YouTuber, one writer on an outlet, we were on a text chat, and one of the, the two guys brought up a couple of days ago that they're hearing that Gladiator 2 is actually amazing and that the studio is so impressed by it, they're actually going to mount a much larger marketing campaign for it than they were originally planning on. And I was like, okay, well, maybe that's true. Again, this is just one person talking to me in a chat thread, right? Well, here's the thing, though. This morning we wake up and read in Deadline about, you know, Ridley Scott, now he's going to do a Bee Gees 
biopic after Gladiator 2 is wrapped. Nice. But kind of hidden in that little part is this thing that says, Scott recently wrapped production on the sequel to a smash hit Gladiator, and according to sources, early footage has blown executives away. Now, the only reason that really caught my attention is because this backs up what these other guys were telling me a few days ago that, and listen, we have heard BS reports before about, you remember the, the Warner Brothers said, oh, the Warner Brothers executives saw Justice League and they gave it a standing ovation. That was never true. Okay, that, that's been debunked. That was never, never, never true. But um, apparently the people are so happy. The Fox people, are, or I should say the Paramount people are so happy with how Gladiator 2 has turned out that they are getting ready to put everything behind it. So the question I have here, Chris, is, is Gladiator 2 going to be Ridley Scott's new Martian, the Martian, or will it be another one of his Robin Hoods? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I don't know, but apparently it's always good when the studio really gets behind it, unlike Sony with Madam Web. Sure. But I know, what do you think about this? Well, hope springs eternal, right? <laughs> I, I want someone to make a good movie, especially you guys are always telling me how amazing Gladiator is. I have to watch that right before I go see this film because I still have never seen Gladiator. I was a wee little thing. My parents didn't take me to a rated R movie. It never happened. Missed the boat on that one. So I am going to watch it. I will say, though, executives don't <laughs> always have the best taste. It's a smash hit. Because I also recall, you know, David Zaslav telling all of us at CinemaCon that The <laughs> Flash was the best superhero movie that had ever been made. Bar none. Well, I remember... To be fair, I thought the movie... I didn't think it was one of the best superheroes, but I thought it was great. I, yes, I, mean, I distinctly recall the executives uh, at Sony saying that The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was their... Uh, their Dark Knight. Yeah, but yeah. to be fair, their to Dark be fair, Knight. If yeah. we want to sit here and cherry pick a couple of examples out of Hollywood history, of no, course, we it's can. not about cherry picking. It's but just, no. it's, but just, it's also about I, I think taste. most Take of the time when the executives get yeah. really behind a movie that they're now seeing done, more times than not, it ends up being pretty good. Sure. I mean, I think it's important to bring up, though, that executives aren't tastemakers. And not always right. And they're not always right. And a lot of times, taste is obviously subjective. We all have different views on, on movies here, just in this room. We all have different movies in the chat here. Sometimes, too, executives like the idea of something. They like sequels. They like worlds that have already been built that people like going back to. They like franchises. And there's always that hope that you can build a cinematic universe out of something or franchise something. So I'm sure executives, if this is good, are thrilled and foaming at the mouth to get this out in theaters of, ooh, hopefully this is more merch, more movies, more money, right. right? That doesn't always equate to fans enjoying something. Hopefully this is an excellent, excellent film. It's got a stacked cast with incredible actors. And really, Scott, while there has been a decline in his work, I'll totally give you that. I mean, an iconic filmmaker who I really hope, I hope the Bee Gees, like really <laughs> ignite him. I hope that that is giving him the the juice he needs for Gladiator, so his career can ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, stay alive. Yeah, let's let's so, let's let you oh, did boy. it. I did. You let's, did that. I did. <laughs> let's not, let's hope he's not one of those fighters that uh, stay into the in the ring too long. Yeah. One one of the more important things that you pointed out was they want a massive marketing push. Paramount right now, from what I I I, I well, you guys have told me like they they shouldn't be spending money, right? So. That's one of the you things. You gotta spend where, money to make money. I know, but for them to do more than planned mm. kind of tells me maybe they really do. These guys are really serious when they say. Well, it, see, it and that's the thing is right now we're juxtaposing this against something that's in theaters right now, right? Madam Web. And we saw the other extreme of this. Sony had zero faith in that movie. They'd never even bothered making a second trailer. They kind of gave up on their marketing campaign. They didn't even release the 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 um uh, review embargo until the day before the movie came out. So there's one example of when a studio has absolutely no belief. And it's easy for somebody to tell you they have belief in something or believe in something. But do you put your money behind that's it? What I, exactly. That's what I was right? trying to point out. And if Paramount is saying, if what these you know whispers right. are saying is that they are so enamored with what they've mm -hmm. got right now that they're saying, we need to put even more into yeah. this and because we think we're going to get back because yeah. we believe it's that and good. And to be fair, the execs mm -hmm. at Paramount do 
I do trust them. Like, typically, I would trust the. the Paramount's had a, a fairly good track record when it's come to big yeah. blockbusters, yeah, right? Well, they invested in Sonic. Lately. They invested in Top Gun too. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles mm -hmm. ended up being like a wonderful win for them. Yeah, yeah I got faith uh, like, in those guys. Mm. Sorry, over that, I, I, if it was a it. different studio, I think I would have that yeah. whole execs love it be an even more. Yeah. Ooh, I don't know because I don't agree with most That's of your cynicism. choices. Yeah, yeah, I'd be much more cynical. Uh, but who knows? Maybe it'll be the next Robin Hood. And it'll be that bad. I don't oh. know. We'll have to wait and see. Guys, question is for you. What do you think? You think this thing can be really good? I mean, obviously, the Paramount execs seem to really believe in it and are talking about dumping a whole bunch of money behind the push of it, unlike what Sony did with Madam Web. Maybe it'll turn out good. Maybe it'll be yet another disaster. What do you guys think? Let us know down below. All right, guys, listen. We still got to talk about a reboot for Bewitched is coming, apparently. And the premiere of Dune 2 has now happened. We heard from regular movie going audiences paying fans who saw it in france but now the big wigs all went to go see it what are the reactions saying and how big can this dune franchise be we're going to get to that and a few things more but first we're going to take a moment and thank a couple of sponsors of today's episode of the john campus show podcast our friends at mint mobile and fume guys we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video mint mobile on average it takes about 30 days for a person to break their new year's resolution so if saving money was on your 2024 list your odds aren't looking that great luckily i have a 100 guaranteed way to save you money this year just switch to mint mobile for a limited time wireless plans from mint mobile are 15 dollars a month when you purchase a three-month plan that's unlimited talk text and data for 15 bucks a month i've told you guys many times that after switching to mint mobile i am spending less than a third on my cell bill than I used to with a major carrier. Say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. All Mint plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And don't worry about having to change phones or numbers. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. So guys, to get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash cam. Campia. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bills to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Fume. Have you ever tried to break a bad habit and it felt like you're climbing uphill? Yeah, well, we've been there too. But here's a breath of fresh air. Fume. It's not about giving up, it's about switching up. Fume takes your habit and simply makes it better, healthier, and a whole lot more enjoyable. Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. You get it, instead of Bad fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and make replacing your bad habit easy. Your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. I'll be honest with you guys, I was a little uncertain about it until my package arrived and I tried it. I couldn't believe how perfectly balanced it is, how fun it is to have in your hands, and how great the actual flavor was. Plus, fume just released a magnetic stand for your fume, so there's no more losing it around the house. So start the year off right with the good habit by going to tryfume.com slash campia and getting the journey packed today. Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use my code campia to help make starting the good habit that much easier. And thank you to our friends at Mint and Fume for sponsoring today's episode. All right, guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? You know, when I was a kid, uh, my parents would always have like the old reruns on. That's where I found shows like Gilligan's Island and stuff like that. But one of the shows that I think my mom really liked was Bewitched. And it was actually kind of a show that was a little bit ahead of its time in many ways. Of course, the whole premise is it's a, a witch living in, at that time, modern America with a muggle husband. Of course, they didn't <laughs> call them muggles at the time. And with an evil, evil witch as a stepmother. So, uh, which, you know, I guess a lot of people found relatable in their families. I don't know. Well, apparently they thought, you know what? That Will Ferrell, Nicole Kidman movie may not have worked all that well, but we think re uh, Bewitched can be rebooted in television format. And here's an interesting choice. They went and got a writer-producer 
from the boys and Gen V. This comes to us from the folks at Deadline who write the following. Writer, produ producer, Judalina Nira, the boys, uh, Daisy Jones and the Six, and also Gen V, has signed on with an overall deal with Sony Pictures Television focused on developing drama series for cable and streaming through her newly launched production company, Famous Last Words Productions. That's a great name for a production company. Mm -hmm. For her first project under the pact, Nira is taking on a signature Sony title, Bewitched. All right. I'm going to tell you that when I first read that, I kind of, my first thought was, well, that seems like desperation. Like, really? D is there an audience for Bewitched? I mean, that's not just an old show. That's a really old show. That, that, that's a before my time show. But the more I thought about it, it started to click that. You know what? Like I said a little bit earlier, Bewitched seems now today like it was a show that was a bit before its time. It essentially is kind of a superhero show in, in some ways. In some ways, it's kind of what WandaVision modeled itself after, was Bewitched. And you take that story in today's context that is kind of, you know, saturated in superhero content, a modern-day context with technology and all that kind of stuff, and the idea of a guy living in suburb America with a sorceress as a wife, I mean, it could be pretty cool. I mean, it's better than trying to reboot I Dream of Genie. So I, I think this one will be a little bit more tangible. And listen, the ver the whole premise, though, really, that I have any enthusiasm for this at all <clears throat> is because specifically they got uh, Judalina on this. Like, her work on The Boys and Gen V, um, I mean, if she can bring that kind of a... Now, I'm not expecting that this Bewitch will be R-rated, but who knows, maybe it is. Maybe the... You know, it's about <laughs> pegging with witch sticks. I don't know. I've just, it's a stretch, I admit. But who knows? Anyway, you Chris. Free peg. Yeah, I was going to say, it's definitely a stretch. <laughs> you hear about this. What do you think? Good idea? Bad idea? I don't know. What are your I thoughts? I think it's a great idea. I really like this. I, I was a Nick at Night kid because my mom grew up with these shows. And so when Nick at Night happened, she would get so excited and, you know, have me watch Bewitched with her or Welcome Back, Cotter or like Happy Days, those kinds of things. So I would watch these shows that felt like such a time capsule. Yeah. It was always in syndication. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really cool to watch those with her. But Bewitched was really ahead of its time. It tackled issues of racism, of sexism, of um, gender inequality at the in the workplace. Uh, it tackled and issues. And at that time, that was, was wild. crazy that yeah. they were dealing with that It was stuff. really, really innovative that this show was doing this, especially with a female lead leading the charge on a lot of those conversations. Um, I also would love them to deal with how they had two different Daryls. I mm -hmm. Darrens. Oh, that's yeah. right. Darrens. They started with um, a different one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of a fun thing that you can mess around with here too. Um, her mom was so ridiculous and over the top and glamorous and I loved her. I think you could do some really cool stuff here, especially with this whole idea of kind of taking an irreverent look at this. I like the idea of what a modern witch would be doing, especially with a very straight laced husband, how that kind of pans out. Cause her husband was this more conservative, hey, please don't use magic uh, kind of guy who should just be like, and keep your mother away from Shut me. up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want. I'm a witch. So I think there's a lot of potential here for it to be a really fun show. I'm going to throw out a name. Yeah. For Darren. Mm. Jason Seagal. Oh, he'd be a cute Darren. Ja I think he would. I, I he could would see be. him being that more straight laced mm -hmm. sort of thing. And Anna Kendrick. As She'd uh, be an adorable Sam. Yeah. Aw. And, and so there you go. You're welcome, Sony. <laughs> I just cast your show for you. There you go. It's perfection. Anyway, guys, question is for you. Are you interested in a Bewitched show? I wasn't at first, but in the modern context, I think there might be something pretty fun you can do with this, especially when you're bringing somebody over from the boys' universe to run the thing. What do you guys think? Jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. That down. Let's move on to this, shall we? So just behind Deadpool 2, for me, my most anticipated film of the year is uh, Dune 2. All the other films in the running breathed a huge, huge sigh of relief when Dune 2 moved out of 2023, which meant that movies like Killers of the Flower Moon and Oppenheimer could have their own little race for best picture because Dune 2 wasn't going to be there anymore. Now, listen. They did their first public screening for Dune 2 earlier this week with a regular average moviegoers paying audience to go see it 
at a theater in Paris. And Denis Villeneuve took the movie out there. And we read on this show a bunch of the reactions of those average film fans coming out. And it was, the reactions were, I mean, iconic. I mean, the, the reactions were absolutely 100% through the roof from that average movie going audience. Well, last night or the other night, they had the actual premiere for Dune 2, where a lot of the celebrities went, but also a lot of the journalists went to go see the film for the first time. And their reactions were even better than the average filmgoers' reactions out of Paris. And it's not an exaggeration to say, some of these things are saying like, this is the sci-fi epic of the generation. Like, like stuff like that. So let's read through some of the reactions here, shall we? That we got from Dune 2. Uh, let's see. Hoy from Inverse wrote, Dune Part 2 is a triumph, even more immense than the first, but much more intimate. Denis Villeneuve manages to streamline the more alienating second half of the book into a riveting, action-packed epic, two towers-level mastery of battle sequences. Oh, I love hearing that. Two towers-level mastery of battle sequences, and Dea is the star. Mike Ryan from Uproxx writes, I was kind of mixed on the first Dune. Dune Part 2 is phenomenal up there with the greatest sci-fi movies I've ever seen. I want to ride a sandworm. Uh, hashtag Dune Part 2. Uh, Ray's getting a kick out of that. All right. Jazz from Variety wrote, Dune Part 2 is a giant epic, a master class of crafts from Greg Fra Fraser's exceptional photography to Patrice uh, Vermetti's magnificent world building. Uh, Denis Villeneuve has delivered his magnus opus, directing one of the best sci-fi films for generations to come. Uh, Katie from the LA Times writes, this is what I texted uh, the foremost Dune head, let me try this again. This is what I texted the foremost Dune head in my life, my dad yesterday. Now in her post, there's a picture of just a text message that says, Dune 2 is amazing. Uh, yesterday after watching Dune Part 2, I'm in a full froth for this thing. It's even better than the first and I <laughs> loved that one. Courtney Howard from the AV Club wrote, Dune Part 2 is jaw-dropping, breathtaking, and wildly exhilarating. It's an adrenaline rush to the head and heart, soaring in its spectacle-driven action sequences as much as it sings in its refined, evocative stillness. Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya turn in singular work. Our friend Brandon Davis wrote, Dune Part 2 is a masterpiece. Denis Villeneuve drops an awe-inspiring, action-packed achievement in a hearty, complex story. It's an astonishing, moving film which demands to be seen on the biggest, most immersive screen possible. I loved it. Innovative and thrilling. Uh, Jeff from Strange Harbors wrote, Dune Part 2, Denis lands every spectacular, brutalist tableau he threw in the air three years ago. Sci-fi myth-making at its finest and most tragic. The gravity of manufactured destiny, the untamable tendrils of belief. I love this. Rosa Parra from Latino Slant wrote, Dune 2 is an epic masterpiece cinematic experience. It's visceral, palpable, and must be seen on the biggest screen possible. Watched it a few days ago, and I'm still riding the high of that experience. Um, and the rich mythology, acting, and story are all elevated by the visuals, visuals and sound design. And it just goes on and on. I mean, we're, we're accustomed to hearing reviews and stuff like that to a great movie saying, this movie's great. This movie's fun. Get out and see it as soon as you can. It is not often that we get a lot of people coming out of these things and singularly saying, this is the sci-fi movie of the next few generations. This thing is a generational kind of movie. This is a movie people will be talking about. This is a movie, and everything from its mythology building to we, we often heard action packed, start to finish, adrenaline rushing, all that kind of stuff, head to toe. And so that kind of raises a question about how big can this Dune thing really be? And that is actually the topic of today's Mint Mobile hotline question of the day. Listen, guys. If you've got a question for our show and you'd like to hear your voice on our show, go ahead and call our Mint Mobile hotline anytime 24-7 at 951-268-4259. And it's about specifically, how big can this thing get? Check it out. Hey, John. What's going on? My name is Lawrence. I hope your day is going well. Quick question. It looks like Dune is getting some good reactions. This is kind of a parallel to Star Wars, right? Because it's pretty similar looking product. Do you think Dune has a chance to become this generation's Star Wars? 
Because if you look at the quality, I think personally, and I think a lot of people will agree with this, that Dune's quality is light years better than what Star Wars put in the movie theaters of recent. Do you think Dune has a chance to become as generational as Star Wars has been? If not, where do you see this Dune franchise going? How successful do you think it can get? Hi, Lauren. Thanks a lot for calling that in. Um, here's the thing. In asking the question, like we're seeing this incredible response and reaction from average film fans to now the press seeing it and everybody saying this thing is straight up mind blowing. But can it be the new generation Star Wars? I mean, I I would have to agree it's better than anything we've gotten in Star Wars last because I I just think this Dune thing is remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable what Denis doing with this thing. But I would say this, there have been many, many franchises that have come and gone over the decades where people are wondering, can this be the new Star Wars? Can this be the new Star Wars? Can this be the next Star Wars? It's never happened. And I don't think Dune, no matter how good it is, is going to be it either. And there's one main reason why, regardless of how good it is, regardless of how much money it makes, I don't think it will be, and that is this. The type of heavy, philosophical, mythological world building that Denis is doing with Dune does not appeal to the vast, wider movie-going audience like something like the space opera Star Wars did. Right? Space, like Star Wars, which is my favorite thing of all time. You guys know that. I've practically modeled my life after Star Wars. But it is a space opera adventure, right? That has a wider appeal base. You know, I mentioned the other day, Ann and I went to go see Dune Part 1 again, and I was just floored and immersed in all this mythology building and world building and the depths of their stories and all that kind of stuff, only to have some of our, my viewers write into me go, eh, Dune's boring. And it's not to say that they're wrong. It's to say that different things appeal to different people, right? That's, that's all it is. Different things appeal to different people. The type, of, the type of dish that Dune 1 was serving up is the type of dish I'll eat all day. Like, to me, it was glorious. But it's not the dish everybody likes. A lot of people love lobster. Guess what? I don't like lobster. I, I, I don't eat lobster. Like, it's not that lobster's bad. It's just not for me. It's not for everybody. And... I think the type of storytelling that Dune does, even if it's if Dune Part 2 is going to be in the midst of this two towers level kind of action, I still don't think it's going to appeal to a wide enough base that it could become as sheer universally beloved as something like Star Wars did back in the 70s and 80s and then endure for generation after generation after generation. And I, I don't say that as a knock on Dune or Dune 2. Like I said, besides Deadpool 3, man, there's no other movie I'm more excited to see than Dune 2. And I think it's going to be spectacular. And according to everything we're hearing from fans and journalists alike, it sounds like it's everything they're promising it'll be. But it's still not going to be the new Star Wars because, again, Denis has made the perfect kind of film. But it's not a film that's going to be for everybody. The same way that something like a Star Wars did or something that a Lord of the Rings did, you know? So... No. Bottom line, I don't think this is going to be the new Star Wars. Anyway, Chris, um, you know, we are hearing remarkable things mm -hmm. uh, about Dune 2. Do you think, as Lauren wrote in and asked, could, if it's good enough, do you think it, it, it could be the next Star Wars for the new generation? What do you think? It could really blow up. It's hard to say because that's such a part of the zeitgeist. But then again, so is the book Dune, right? That book series is yeah. very, very popular with folks. Um, Star Wars just hit this kind of cultural nerve in the best way, though, that, you know, permeated generations. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to say after seeing one film if the sequel is going to be that, right? If this is going to be their empire, if this is going to be their two towers. And I'm one of those people who that first film, I went, I'm not, I'm not into this. This is kind of boring to me. 
And again, I understand that it's a pacing thing, that this does follow the pace of the book. I am an absolute apologist for all of Tolkien's works of how slow those are. I'm like, but once you get past the description of grass, it's a really good book. Um, So I can understand. And I I, I keep hoping that this is going to be an epic, amazing follow-up. And I keep hearing that it is. But you you do, unlike the first one, you did not watch this from home the first time. Yeah, I watched it from home. Yeah. And this one I'll obviously see in theaters. And that will change things, right? It is different when you can hear your neighbors arguing and (laughs) your dog needs to be let out in the middle of the movie than seeing it on a big screen. This obviously will make more money than the first one because we're not doing that day and date release. I know people were projecting, what, $195 million for that kind of first... For its uh, domestic run or something? Oh, no. I think it's it's opening their project. Oh, you mean overall domestic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, I'm not sure. I didn't but, see what those numbers um, were. I think that was on like coming soon. It was like $195 million domestic um, with anticipation of it doing really well at the global box office. It's just hard to say if it is going to have that kind of impact because we haven't seen it. We've only heard how other people have viewed it. And typically, typically, people are a bit more jazzed when they are at the premiere when they are seeing things with the cast and crew all there, those reviews are usually more positive than other reviews that come out later on when it's released to the masses. But these are really, really popular uh, books. This is a really great cast. And if people are that into this and saying that this is the new standard of sci-fi, there's a lot of potential here. Yeah. The thing that kind of really stuck out to me was that how consistent it was with the average moviegoers who went to go see it a few days earlier in France. Sure. I, again, I just feel like I don't know that a lot of teenagers will be into this movie. I, I, I it's just it's just on a different kind of they, tone length. They you know are, what I mean? but I feel like that's not even the situation because even how we you compared like Lord of the Rings, they are kind of like the the, the standard bearers. But I would go as far as saying even Lord of the Rings, it didn't have that hit. Star Wars was something no one ever saw before in theaters. Yeah. And then it became this like cultural hit for mm-hmm. over a decade and then into the 90s and then it pushed into like the 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 prequels and all that. I just don't think I mean there's a reason there's a book called, you know, Star Wars changed what was it? Star Wars changed the universe. How Star-, Star Wars conquered the universe. Conquered the universe. There's yeah. a reason why it's that and not Dune or Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Because it was more than just the popularity at the time. Sure. It's what it what it was. So Obviously, Lord of the Rings was the one that I was like, I'm going to model my life I'm around like, this. Sit, I'm not sitting here saying like, oh, Lord of the Rings is not even as good. As, I'm just yeah. saying that Star Wars was the one that changed the universe of filmmaking and everything. Sure, so. sure, sure, sure. I, I don't think this has to be anything like, you know, compared to Star Wars at all. I think it fills some sort of void in the sci-fi uh, audience. Yeah, there really aren't I mean, any similarities between Dune I mean, and Star Wars. Uh, no. Yeah, not really. It could be a great replacement for Star Wars since Star Wars has been kind of not that great in, in on the big screen lately, sure. I guess, people. So it could be a great replacement. It could fill a void, but I don't think it has to. I don't expect it to or compare it to Star Wars at all. See, I mean, here's the just, thing. I would compare Dune more to There Will Be Blood than I would uh, than I would compare it to mm. Star Wars. Um, oh, I will say, okay. I mean, they do like a lot of Tatooine sand. Yeah, there, yes. yeah I'm like, there's, there's a lot of like sand, sand here. Yeah. Sci-fi. I can see sand to fi. the Honorable well Ray done. that, yeah, yes, you're probably right. The sand is definitely uh, the big yeah. selling point there. So uh, all I know is we are what? Two 25th, weeks away? Baby. We're going to see it on the 25th. The 25th is when we're seeing it? Yep. But Ten popcorn, days. But the popcorn buckets don't release until February oh. 29th. Right, right. So I think we can all agree that the popcorn buckets will be more successful than the movies. Yeah. Well, for some people. I mean, for all the right and wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah. For uh, mostly the wrong ones. I can't wait to see how much money that popcorn bucket makes. It's going to be 30 bucks, I bet you, too. I, I'm still like, did no marketing person stop and say? Every marketing person. Every marketing person <laughs> like, approved it. They said yes. But did they, they went, not look at this and say, you know, people might use this for the wrong yeah, reason. You know, I stand by. Who wants eyes. to be the person who in a room says, I think someone's going to put their dick in it. Like well, you I don't want to be the first person to say it. Justin Timberlake has got to go back to Saturday Night Live and do a remake of Dick in a Box because yeah. this will completely Absolutely. change. It was seen by innocent eyes. You know what they someone needs to do? That. Someone needs to make like intercut uh, with that scene in Air where they were talking about designing the perfect shoe. Right. <laughs> and then, and then intercut, <laughs> intercut like, like specs of this thing. Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> Absolute perfection. All right, guys. 
With that down, we are now going to go over to the main part of our show, which is the most important part, which is hearing from you, taking your live thoughts, theories, and comments. We're going to do that in just a second, but before we get to it, we're going to take just a quick moment here and thank another sponsor of today's episode, our friends at Harry's. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Harry's. You know, guys, in order to start the John Campia show, I had to leave my high paying corporate job in order to set myself up to be happier and enjoy more personal success. Because sometimes to get what you want, you have to challenge the status quo and blaze your own trail. And that's exactly what the folks at Harry's did. You see, at Harry's, they saw customers getting ripped off by questionable products in the shaving industry and decided to do something better. Harry's decided to pave their own road by making beautifully designed razors for a fraction of the price of the other big brands, except Exceptional products, honest prices. That's Harry's. I have fallen in love with Harry's from their foaming shaving gel that feels just luxurious on the skin to their incredible razor that feels just as good in the hand as it does going over your skin. They've got rich lathering skin softening body wash and scents like Redwood, Wylands, and Stone. You see, Harry's provides German engineered blades made in their own factory that stays sharp longer. You can get a five blade razor, weighted handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel cover for just three bucks at harrys.com slash campia. Don't settle for the status quo. Blaze your own trail with Harry's. Get started with a $13 trial set for just $3 at harrys.com slash campia. That's harrys.com slash campia for a $3 trial set. And thank you to our friends at Harry's for sponsoring today's episode. All right, guys, that all down. Let's get over to your topics and questions, shall we? Chris, what do we got up here first? We're starting with Dr. Stinky. Dr. Stinky. So I saw Madam Webb. Um, wow, what a shite show. <laughs> the longest two hours of my life. The movie was getting laws wrong. <laughs> and the dialogue, yikes. One out of ten. Uh, got one. I, I might, I, I'll give it a two. Yeah, I don't give scores movies. I'll give it a two. Um, like I said, there's a scene between her and her mom that was that was pretty nice. Um, couple that was, of the, that was like the flash scene. Too, yeah, right? yeah. It you know it it had a, a little little bit not to stop it from being a completely horrendously awful movie, but yeah, man. They got the title of the movie right, so they get one point for that. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, oh, and the final shot. Oh yeah, with yeah, Madam right. Webb with the with the three Spider Girls. It was a good shot. I'll you give know, credit where it's due. That was a good shot. You know what I think about <laughs> most people probably didn't make it to that part and left nope, already. Nope, they probably left before it was done. Yeah. All right, what's next? From James Wheeler, sending in a $20 super Thank chat. Thank you, James. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. If any of you want to see a great movie with Tahar Rahim, watch A Prophet, an amazing French crime thriller from 2009. It is so good. Oh, and you know what? I totally... Give me a second here. Um, I totally forgot about... Uh, another movie he was in. A, a friend of mine reminded me because I, I totally forgot he was in this one movie. And now I, it, give me a moment to bring it up because it, he was really good in it and actually maybe even could have gotten an Academy Award nomination. Oh, The Manchurian. He was so good in The Manchurian. Mm. Um, loved him in that. I all, forgot he was in Napoleon. Oh. But I hated Napoleon. Yeah. So uh, that's probably why it didn't <laughs> stand out to me. Yeah, you know what? I found out yesterday that I did not know. What? I was doing open mic yesterday. And of course, Tahar does the, um, he plays the villain in Madam Web. And I said, I'm not saying he's a bad actor. I'm just saying this was the worst performance I'd ever seen in a comic book movie, right? I, I mentioned that yesterday. Well, the audience wrote into me when I was doing open mic last night that they, apparently they dubbed his voiceover. I knew it. <clears throat> So that's and not even his. I know said what? that after we left. So that wasn't even his voice? So apparently that wasn't even his voice. That makes sense because... I it does, because now that I look back on the lines, I'm like, that totally tracks. Also, that totally yeah. tracks. I remember Logan Jeremy Jones was tonight. saying in his in his review that there was oftentimes his lips were moving, yeah. but the words weren't matching his lips. Exactly. Oh, you got to match the mouth flaps. Yeah. yeah. Rookie Chris mistake. Carr, you had to see Carr it. There. Yeah. I should have dubbed I mean, the, the dialogue was so dead. You know I, when they say uh, that sometimes you can tell when an actor is acting in front of a green screen and not in a real environment because sure. they just don't know what... Like, I feel like that can sometimes be true too. That's what it felt like in this particular instance. Like the person, whoever they got to do the voice had no idea about the context of what was happening in the scene. 
these girls have to not exist so they can't kill me in the future. Perfect. Got it. We'll move on. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Let's <laughs> like in the on. booth. Like, yeah, it's great. <laughs> we're, we're pressed for time. Uh, <laughs> I feel bad. Like, I remember I saw pictures uh, a couple days ago of like mm -hmm. the premiere. I'm like, those actors and actresses had to like sit in an audience with the premiere and everyone pretend they liked it. Oh. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I'm seeing it tonight. Because Yay! I, I just want to be miserable like all of you. Um, is this something where, and I don't want any one of you to do this at home, children. Um, is this a drinking game in the making? Is this something where a gummy needs to be dropped? What do I? I, I came fully prepared. All of the above. Okay. I had I had I ordered some sliders, some curly fries, some popcorn, and he fell asleep because, halfway through. Yeah, but I was like, I still didn't make it through the whole. So. No, uh, half the time I looked over, like I'm sitting to this side of Ray. Ray was. <laughs> <laughs> because, man, it was like, I, I don't know if that movie made me, like, knock me out, like, in a, a different way. Mm -hmm. Like, it was that bad where it's just like, it did something where I was just like, I can't see. I'm just something. excited to have this as a measurement of time now. There's before Madam Web, and then and there after will be after. Oh. I'll tell you what, this movie just heaved off and kicked me in the happiness balls. It just took all of it away. Like, all happiness was just sucked out of you watching this movie. It's so bad. Well, Fra freezing. Freezing. Uh, Dune popcorn. Dune popcorn. We got that to look forward to. <laughs> all right, what's next? Goodness gracious. From Suthius. So it seems that uh, Skarking wants to rule the surface world, but in order to do that, he would need to unleash the ice titan upon it. Would you all agree? I, in movies like this... It is folly to try to think we know what the movie's about by looking at very pieced together trailers. Um, so I don't know if that, again, if there's not a scene, clearly there, there's a tag team match coming up here. Godzilla and Kong <laughs> versus Scar King and uh, right. whatever the white dragon is, is going to come out of the lava. And, and I, I said this yesterday, but I stand by it. If we do not have Godzilla and Kong at some point tagging each other, I don't know what we're doing anymore. I don't know what we're doing. Well, why we're making movies anymore. Kong's gonna have to do the reaching on that one. Yeah, he's got. To, Kong's gonna be like <laughs> behind behind the ropes reaching in. Kong's yeah, getting beat, or Godzilla's getting gonna beat be up like by this. the two of them. He's like, you he's gotta like, come closer. Kong, tag. Kong comes in. He's gonna be like, I'm over they here. Start stomping on him. I only go dropping this far, people's man. elbows. I want to see that. <laughs> All right, what's next? From Dildar, the glorious. Yeah. Seeing people lose their minds on Twitter over the X-Men being woke, and it's driving me nuts. How dumb are they to not know they always were? Again, Wait a anybody who uses the word woke, I just assume is mentally incapacitated. Wait, this is woke? I, just, oh, I can't watch it then. You can't watch it, oh, no. Okay. Oh, well. Like, I, I mean, it's evolved to... If there's anybody who's not white in the movie, it's woke. If there's a girl in the movie, it's woke. And... Again, it's just a thing. Anybody who now uses the word woke to me in a conversation, I, my natural assumption is you're an idiot, and I just tune them out. So that's just me at this point. All right, what's next? From Jay Loco. How about how, uh, Pablo Schreiber for Kratos? He can act. I he can. Listen, I, my first exposure to him, I think, was in that, hey, oh. that heist movie he did with Gerard Butler and 50 Cent. Um I'm trying to remember the, the name of it. Yeah, it was Run the Run the Night Run the Town. So, no, 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 that was No, that's a like that um That was like a song. <laughs> but I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the name of the movie. I, at any rate, and I like him as Master Chief. I do. I could You know what? I could kind of see him Den of Thieves, James uh of James Thieves, Fan sorry. in the live I'm chat. So close. Den of Thieves, that's the movie exactly. Thank you, man. Um I could see it. I mean, it might not be my first choice, but if they cast him, I'd go, yeah, I could see that. That's actually a really good pick. All right, what's next? From uh, Mr. I Captain Schitz. Captain Schitz, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, it's my 45th birthday Happy today. Birthday. Hey, Happy birthday. Just wanted to thank you all for an insightful and entertaining show. Bring on the filthy. I'm so sorry I said your name probably so wrong. Happy birthday. Oh, no, that is clearly a fake last name. Yeah, I 45 know. and he still has his youth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, seriously, happy birthday. Thank you I for spending part of your birthday with us here today, man. We appreciate that very much. Hope you have a great year, dude. All right, what's next? From Christopher Brickner, since 2021, Travis Knight has been filming Wildwood. What's Wildwood again? I have no idea about it. Okay. Yeah, no, so I mentioned the other day that, look, after doing Kubo and the Two Strings, and then, which is 
masterful. So good. And then Bumblebee, which he accomplished the impossible, resuscitating a, the dead corpse of the Transformers and actually breathing some life into it. 2018, six, going on seven years ago, and he hasn't directed anything since. Oh, yeah, he has. He, he's been working on this thing called Wildwood. Do you, can you look it's up a, some it's information? It's a stop motion it? animated film. Oh, okay, so because he is still the ceo of uh Leica. Leica, yeah yeah right so That's that it. that tracks that tracks all right what's next from matt sanders if i see madam webb this weekend it'll be with a buzz and the dune popcorn bucket in my hand i i yeah yeah maybe uh nintendo switch uh maybe, oh my God. maybe I just feel like something else keeps up entertained from what i've heard of this movie it's not going to get you to where you need to be to use that dune bucket yeah that's uh you know i was gonna say something but yeah. filter between the brain and the mouth kicks in and works again i'm not gonna say it now all right what's next from raymond verata from the thursday previews the bob marley film is doing better than madam webb speaking of biopics ridley scott is in line to direct the Bee Gees film yeah um i don't know that i care um i'm not a big Bee Gees guy what? And staying alive, staying alive. Yeah, I, I, I'm not really sure. Although there was a video, nobody cares about this, but uh, for some reason, this video popped up in my YouTube uh, flow where this guy plays metal and he did a BG song in heavy metal version though. And it was awesome. It was really, really, really good. So there's that. All right, what's next? From uh, Mr. I. Krappenschutz again. John, as to your question last night, the ads don't bother me. Keep the crew, the banter, and camaraderie you all have. That's the reason I watch. So I, I brought up on, uh, it came up yesterday on, on Open Mic that I just mentioned that, you know, some people don't like watching commercials or wonder why we have sponsors. And I say, well, you got to understand, like, we, the John Campus Show YouTube channel, make no mistake about it we are a tiny insignificant youtube channel like we are really really quite small when you compare us to like legit youtube channels and no channel our size should have a staff besides me like channels my size don't have staffs the reason we're able to put on being such a tiny insignificant channel that we're able to put on a show with the production value that we have and and have the talent that we have working with me is because a channel my size has really great sponsors and that's what makes it happen. So, you know, we were talking about that last night about like, yeah, I guess we could get rid of our sponsors, but then it's literally just going to be me in a spare bedroom. And, uh, you know, we're able to do a lot of things that most channels our size cannot do because we have such great sponsors. So we were just talking about that a little bit. All right. What's next? From Fang Blaze, I've been watching the second season of Halo, and I'm extremely impressed. Today's episode was fantastic. It might help. I don't know much about the game. I did not see the newest episode. I saw the first two episodes, and I quite liked them. Uh, the uh, first two episodes of the new season. You didn't like the newest episode? I No, the problem is I did a lot. And the problem Why is that is, a problem? Why are you sighing? The problem is <laughs> I need. Uh, they need to drop these, like, two, two episodes every time. They Because they, it, it's leaving me in a place where... Last night when it ended, I was like, oh, my God. I was more upset that I wasn't going to see what's happening next. Until next week. Until next week. Got it. So it's a, it left you wanting more, Ray. That's the first rule of entertainment. And then I was saying, should I just let three episodes pass and then watch them all at the same time? But then I won't be a part of the conversation. Conversation, right. That's the problem. So, so, uh, so the third episode's good. Yeah. <laughs> he, says, he says so <laughs> the upset. Most depressed so I've ever been. No, because yeah. I expected yeah. something else to happen. But thing. it just started happening at that end. All right, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll watch it myself later today. All right, what's next? From Christopher Brickner again. I saw Madam Webb. I have questions. How is 2003 face recognition so good? How did Sims get the visions of the girls from his dreams oh into the Oh my computer? God, I'm so glad you brought that up because I totally didn't bring this up in the open spoiler discussion yesterday. By the way, I'm going to spoil things in Madam Webb here and you're welcome Let's because go. you don't want to go see this. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, but no. Chris, Chris may not need to hear this. Oh, no, spoil oh, away. Okay. It was practically empty anyway. Okay. Um, so here's the thing. In the movie, uh, it's 2003 and somehow they have like base tracking technology that would 
barely be feasible in 2018, right? Like they have this like super advanced. First of all, his girl in a chair, you know, Spider-Man's got Ned. Yeah. He, so the bad guy's got a girl in the chair and she's got computer monitors up that were not around in 2003. But okay, that's, that's neither here nor there. So she's using this like advanced tracking technology, face detection and tracking technology to find these girls anywhere they are in the city, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, that wasn't around. The okay, but it's fine. It's a comic book movie. People don't actually have spider superpowers either. Okay, I'm willing to let that slide. But, but, the whole thing hinges upon the bad guy's been having these dreams that these three spider women, all wearing masks, go in on. His dream, by the way, <laughs> Yeah. murder him sometime in the future when he's a little older, gray hair and all that kind of stuff, right? They murder him in the future. So he gets his girl in the chair, steals this high-tech software that can track faces, but the problem is they don't have the faces. He's never met the girls. He's only ever seen them in his dream. And somehow, without explanation, he was able to recreate the perfectly detailed faces of the girls in his dream. I mean, like, hardcore perfection <laughs> accurate. Just from, okay, so this girl, her eyes were a little bit further apart. And they're like 100% accurate without the masks. So perfect that this face tracking technology is able to find the girls where they, wherever they are in the city. And I totally meant to bring that up in the spoiler discussion review, and I totally forgot, I'm so glad you mentioned it, yet another one of the big fuck yous to the face that mm. Madam Web gives its audience. It's such a bad movie. I mean, this is so League's bad. worse, but it reminds me, it harkens back to Batman versus Superman when uh, Bruce Wayne gets that file and all the heroes already have, like, Wonder Woman logos and, oh, yeah. and everything oh, yeah. in the computer. Yeah. Like, He's already done branding. They have like <laughs> logos and everything yeah. for them. And because and Batman's meticulous about presentation. He's like, listen, I, I created I run your logos. Wayne Enterprise. I understand about brand synergy. Yeah. But, but <laughs> okay. like, wait till you see it tonight. You'll see the scene. Like, I'm, it's like, it's like, okay, so now let's put these girls in the software. Was it? You don't have a picture of these girls. You just dreamt yeah. about it. Yeah. But Chris Carr is entering the theater. Chrissy D'Anizio is leaving it. <laughs> <laughs> There's your next thing for the sandworm, Ray. Yeah. Chris Carr going in. Me coming Denise in Hill all nice out. and then yeah, drunk me just being like, it's fucking movie. Let me yeah, tell you about this piece of shit. All right. What's next? <laughs> Go on. From <laughs> if Fantastic Four is set in the MCU 616, over under 25%, either Howard Stark or Peggy Carter will appear in it since it'll be in the 60s. Is the villain still Galactus? No one ever said the villain was Galactus. Yeah. Uh, so let's be clear about that. Yeah, somebody wrote in on open mic saying, could we see Howard Stark and uh, Hank Pym? A younger Howard Stark and Hank Pym, kind of like we did at the beginning of the one movie. If it's the 60s, Howard uh, Hank Pym would be too young. Would he? Yeah, because, well, I no, no you know, in the 70s, there. he was in his 30s. Yeah. So, be or 40s. Yeah. yeah. So, he could be, be, okay. young he Hank Pym. He'd be very young, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a young Hank Pym, they could do it. It all depends on how long they're actually in the 60s and and that's what we don't know like literally they could be in the 1960s for the first five minutes of the movie and then it picks up it picks up with them waking up in a spacecraft coming back into the earth's atmosphere but 60 years has passed you know something like that so we just don't know but if the movie takes place for any significant amount of time in the 1960s i'd say there's a good 50 percent chance that we see either I don't know about Peggy Carter, although she pops up in more stuff than others do. So I'd say there's a 50-50 chance that we see either a young Hank Pym, a Howard Stark, or Peggy Carter. 50%, I'll say. All right, what's next? From Damaris Love, will Doom 2 be released for the first in a marathon for any of the cinemas that would be awesome? A double feature presentation in IMAX or Dolby? Well, they kind of don't need to do that now because they've had they've re they already did re-release Dune. Like Anne and I just went to go see Dune Part One again in theaters the other night. It's been playing in IMAX, so it kind of takes away from the need to do it. Plus, that would be a long, long two movies because I, I think Dune Part Two is two hours and forty minutes, uh, and the first one ain't a quick jaunt in the park either. So that'd be long. But again, I I would say there would be maybe a chance to do it, except for the fact that they just did a whole nationwide re-release of part one. So I'm going to guess that they won't, but they could. It's possible. All right. What's next? 
From Andy, Hi, John. I expected you to do a quick non-spoiler review, but I did not expect a full fucking recap. <laughs> I loved every second of it. Thank you, John. Well, thank you. Listen, and there are things I forgot to mention, hence the, the face recognition stuff and, like... I could have sat, like, look, I had to force myself to stop. I could have sat and talked about Madam Web all day <laughs> for all the wrong reasons. Um, and look, it's not that it's the worst movie of all time. It's it's not. I don't even have it in the unholy trinity of the three worst Hollywood wide, wide release films of all time. Battlefield, Earth, uh, uh, Catwoman, and Highlander 2. The three worst wide release Hollywood produced. It's not up there. I think part of the reason why I get so irritated, look, studios will make bad movies. Part of the reason I get so irritated about it, and I've mentioned this, but but I'll say it again for those of you who haven't been around for the last couple of days, is I like Sony as a studio overall quite a bit. They just actually announced, they just had their most profitable quarter in ages. Uh, yeah, they just did their right. earnings call, and like they had the most profitable quarter in ages, and obviously this was before Madam Web came out. <laughs> but... I, I, and there's a lot of things they do that is very, very good and very, very smart and all that kind of stuff. But here's the thing. Not only did they hire the writers of Dracula Untold, Gods of Egypt, uh, what were the other ones? Uh, the Last Witch Hunter. Um, not only did they hire probably the worst working writers in Hollywood to write Morbius, but once they did write Morbius and they saw the results of Morbius, they decided to hire them again to write Madam Web. And, and that, that is the part that, like we all say, somebody should be fired for that over every little mistake that a studio makes, right? We all do it way too much. I, I admit that as fans, we do that way, 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 way too. Sports fans do that. We do that. All, all the movie fans do it. We all do it too much. But with all the honesty in my heart and I'm, and I'm not trying to be mean, but not only should those writers never be allowed to write a Hollywood screenplay again, whatever the team was that decided let's hire those guys again to write Madam Web, they should be out of a job. They should not. I'm sure they're great at something else in life and they're missing out on their potential by having this studio exec job. Free them from their studio exec job so they can go, you know, create the new and improved churro or something because they ain't reaching their potential being studio executives. They need to lose their job. And we're missing out on delicious churros. So, yeah, everybody will win. What's next? From Andy again. Uh, when the three women in Madam Web danced on a table for a group of guys at a diner, I thought they were going to strip considering how stupid this movie was. I. <sighs> You know, somebody tried to write to me and say, John, you just don't get it. Sometimes teenagers do impulsive things. Oh, I know. I was a teenager. You know what? I used to work with teenagers. I used to work with teenagers. I used to run youth programs. You were a youth ago. pastor. You were a cool youth pastor. Age, I was the cool <laughs> youth pastor. The hair down here. I was Toby fucking McGuire. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know that teenagers can be stupid. I know that. I never met teenagers that stupid. Like, the three is the dumbest collection of fictional characters I've ever seen assembled on a screen. They are, like, every word, every action is layered in stupidity. And the whole dancing on the table thing. Like, I mean, we're so literally, we are, we were literally just, they, somebody's try, yeah. is hunting us with superpowers that just murdered a bunch of police. We need to lay low. Not only did they go to a diner, but say, hey, let's go over to that table and dance on the table. You got to blow off some steam. Oh, my God. I, it's, oh, God. I wish Chris had seen it already because I would love her input on this. But, all right. <laughs> I got to get next? some strong text. <laughs> you guys, next? this movie. Andy, again, I don't care about Coyote versus Acme. I want Cody versus Acme. <laughs> WB cheated Cody out of his movie. Finish his movie. Hashtag we want Cody. Oh, finish this. Oh, boy. You know what's so funny? Here's the, th here's the funny thing about the Cody situation. And I'm no Cody hater. He's a great wrestler. But he was a mid-Carter nobody when he was with the WWE. 
And then he, and nobody really cared about him. And then he left WWE to go to AEW and, and kind of found that thing. Then kind of stabbed his partners there in the back and left, left there to come back to WWE. And all of a sudden now that apparently, you know, there's an old joke. Do you guys remember the comic strip Dilbert? Yeah. yeah. They used to do these jokes where you can be totally inept in your job, but if you leave and come back as a consultant, they'll pay you triple the money. Like that was an ongoing joke. And it's like Cody Rhodes thing is he was a mid Carter at best in the WWE leave and come back and you're headlining WrestleMania. Again, I think he's a great, I've seen him wrestle. Like he's, he's a great wrestler, but it is so funny to me seeing the, the social dynamics of wrestling fans when it comes to wrestlers who were literally borderline nobodies. They leave and, and if they come back, it's the greatest thing. They're the greatest thing in the world, but eh, whatever. All right. What's next? From Andy Hiller, Tom Ellis for Bond. Other than faves, who do you want? Um, I, I, again, I don't really care. I just want them to cast Bond with whoever they think is going to be the best representation mm -hmm. of the new Bond they're going to create. Tom Ellis is fabulous. I love Tom Ellis. So, and for those of you who don't know who Tom Ellis is, he played Lucifer in the television show Lucifer, which is a show I totally adored. So I could see him in the role. My number one choice is still Henry Cavill, but I'm sure there's a there are dozens and dozens of people they can cast who would be excellent in the role. All right, what's next? From Red Arrow, hear me out, Krasinski as the maker in Secret Wars. Well, no, you know what's funny? Rob and I were talking about that. Now, for those of you who don't know who the maker is, the maker is a, some would say evil version of Reed Richards. Some would say he is the natural progression of Reed Richards who does some very bad, bad things. Um, bad, bad. I, no, I think if they, if they ever did decide to go with the maker, which they very well might do, I think they're still, they'll use Pedro Pascal for it. I don't think they'll use John Krasinski for it. But if they did, that would be kind of fun too. But nobody wants to see Jim as a bad guy. Nobody wants to see John Krasinski as a bad guy. All right, what's next? From Captain... I became a fan okay, of Channing. Okay, so yesterday, oh, just a little thing. We were we were doing open I'm the mic now, and I was we were, I can't even remember what the topic was, but I had to make up a fictitious. I said, I don't know. Say you got a movie, and I just had to make up something. I said, Captain Dick in Hand, oh, and okay. I, I said, and and so we made this movie, and I <laughs> and I said, damn it, they should make this movie. Hashtag justice for Dick and Hand. But anyway, so that's where there Captain Dick and Hand comes from. Oh. That's still right, needs to come out of my human mouth. I became a fan <laughs> of Channing Tatum after the Jump Street movies. Oh, yeah. My name is Jeff. You know where, uh, what was the comedy he did before that? It was one of the ones, who was the star of King of Queens again? What was his name? Uh, Kevin, Kevin James. James. There was a comedy movie with Kevin James that Channing Tatum had a role in. And it was a comedic role. No, 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 no. It wasn't that one. It was, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of something else entirely. Um, but I started to warm up to Channing Tatum <clears throat> prior to the 21 Jump Street movies. I started to warm. I saw him getting better and better and better. But then, man, the Jump Street movies just sent him into another level. Like he truly found where his comfort zone is. It wasn't dancing and all the, it was, He's got such natural, pure comedic timing. And it's one of the best comedic performances, I think, in straight-up comedies. I'm not saying it's the best, but it, it's really terrific when you look at his timing in it. It's fabulous. Still, one of my all-time favorite scenes in a comedy, and it's it's all about the absolute perfect timing, is that scene in Jump Street 2, 22 Jump Street, when him... And uh, Jonah are sitting in Ice Cube's office, and all oh, right. And Channing Tatum is the only one who doesn't know that Jonah yeah. Hill is sleeping with Ice Cube's daughter. <clears throat> and then he's just sitting there, and you hear this tick, 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 and then this little bell, bing. And then Channing Tatum, your fucking daughter. It's like it was just like one of the. F I laughed so freaking hard in that. Yeah, man. He's. I hope not to beat a dead horse. I really want them to do a 23 Jump Street. Jonah Hill seems really pretentious these days. Yeah. I don't know why. And um, I, I think he Jonah Hill might look at something as 23 Jump Street as being beneath him now or something. Yeah. But 
I I would love for those two to team up again and do more Jump Street. I really would. All right, what's next? From Mega Red, what up, crew? Finally watched Fellowship of the Ring for the first time last nice. night. Nice, so good. I loved that it's a story of friendships, courage, and loyalty. Ready for two and three. P.S. I think Tatum is one hundred percent Gambit. I'm jealous. <clears throat> I still remember <clears throat> the first time I saw <clears throat> Fellowship of the Ring. Now. For everybody who reads a book or played a video game or a movie version that came out later, we all have a vision in our own heads about how it should look on the screen. And I remember I actually had tears starting to, I didn't cry, but I had tears starting to welp in my eyes because as I was watching the opening, not the, the, the pre-log thing where she's talking about uh, the history of the ring, but rather when the movie itself starts and Gandalf is riding into the Shire, and I, I just remember thinking to myself, like, for my whole life, like, The Hobbit's the first book I ever read. And my whole life, I dreamed about seeing The Shire and about seeing this in a real live action movie or show. And when he rolls in that cart over the rolling hill and comes in the Shire and that Howard Shore music starts to play, na -na 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 -na. I, I just felt tears in my eyes welling up. It was like one of the most powerful moving experiences I had in a movie theater because it was like decades and decades of me waiting to see this and there it was. And uh, all I can tell you, man, is it just keeps getting better as you get into parts two and three. So I envy you and the journey you're on right now, my friend. All right, what's next? From Mr. I... Crap and shits again. <laughs> hey, Ray, Xbox not Xbox not leaving console market. New hardware in the works. Only a oh, few nice. older games going multi-platform. Heck yeah. Well, for competition, yeah, we need to still make consoles. I'll still buy them. That's good news. I mean, Xbox is not doing too well, but that's my console choice. <clears throat> but so. Game Pass is doing well, is yeah, it not? Well, like, I've heard Game Pass is doing quite that's well for the, them. That's the one thing. They come out with something... Well, that works for me. Everyone's got a different budget, but it works for me. And then it, it actually hurts another side of the their business, consoles, because you might not even need hardware. Yeah, you're you just should. fine with Game Pass. So I, I mean, before my when when Jonathan's computer was mine, because Jonathan's using right. a PC, that was my used to be my computer. Uh, that's where I was playing a lot of my games was through Game Pass on the PC. Yeah. All right. What's next? From Real Life Entertainment, between Fantastic Four and Deadpool, maybe John will actually visit Disneyland for a meet and greet. <laughs> yeah, right. You wouldn't need either of those for Disneyland, so probably not. I I, I have to admit something. Oh, boy. Here it is. No, I, I, this, is a, this is a bait and switch. Nope, nope. True thing. Straight up here. I'm being honest with you. My wife loves going to Disneyland. Yeah. Right. She goes like at least once a month with some friends of hers and stuff like that. And I was talking to another friend of mine and we were talking about marriage and stuff like that. And one of the things I mentioned about marriage is like, look, one of the things I've learned is that once you get married, your life isn't about you anymore. This, this is what I was saying. Like your life's folks now has to turn to, I said, I see my whole purpose in life right now, my purpose, my mission in life. Um, is to support Anne and to do everything in my power to give her as happy as a life that, that I can possibly give her. That's the main goal of my life. And some people may agree or disagree with that. No, you need to maintain your own individual. That, that's fine. But to me, that's the main goal of my life. Everything I do from still working a job to, you know, everything else, everything I do is about how do I support Anne and how do I try to make her as happy as I can? I don't do much else in life well, but that one is the one I'm going to try my best to do well. So my friend jokingly said to me, yeah, except for go to Disneyland with her, right? And that cut me like a fucking knife. Ooh. And Disney got you. There's few things my wife likes doing more for fun than going to Disneyland. Yeah. And so a couple weeks ago, <laughs> uh -oh. I told Anne... Let's get me a pass. And she's like, what? I'm like, you love going to Disneyland. And so I'm going to go to Disneyland with you. Man, the problems you have. That's, yeah, I know, right? I'm that, going to Disneyland. I struggle. hate Disney. I fucking hate Disney and their predatory fucking parks. <laughs> yeah. And their, mm, but 
But yeah, for my wife, I will go. So like, because you're right. It's like, you, yeah, you talk a big talk. Like you'll do all this stuff for your wife. All she wants you to do, dude, is go to Disneyland with her. I'm like, then I felt like crap. I'm and like, it's just one. You're experience. right. I'll, I'll go to. So I am about to start going to. Di- I'm not going to go with her every time. Maybe no. two or three times a year, I'll go with her. But I am going to start going to Disneyland. I just want to make a droid. That's all I want. To make a droid. <clears throat> Did you ever come with us to Disney? I've never been. Oh no, to you. The Star we brought Wars. you to Universal Studios. Yeah, 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 yeah that's, that's right. That's like in my budget right there. <laughs> it's all fun, right. Man. What's Let's next? Please. I just call him Mr. I. Mr. I, from John, uh, John, as a fan of a long-suffering fan base, who do you think is in a better position to win a championship sooner, your Maple Leafs or my Browns? Hockey, both of them, or who are Browns? I would say the Cleveland Browns. Oh, okay. Except, your Cleveland Browns, man, <clears throat> I, they screwed themselves with that Deshaun Watson deal. Uh, first of all, they they picked up a they they paid him way more than he's worth, but they also completely mortgaged their future with what they paid him. There's it's not a coincidence that they had their most success this year when their 44 year old backup quarterback Joe Flacco, who they pulled off a soup kitchen line somewhere and pulled back into the league and and he started blowing up and having real success. It's going to be tough for the Browns, I think, for a while. I don't think they can win with Jason Watson, and they don't not going to have the money to do much else. So, as and listen, and the Leafs are at least having a great year. The Leafs are having a really good year. So, there's not many teams that I would say that I think the Leafs will win a championship first. But unfortunately, with the Browns, I, I think that's the case. And which is too bad because I thought, I thought the Browns were really putting together a nice culture and all that kind of stuff, and then they went and got the happy ending guy. Um, oh, you don't know the scandal with Deshaun Watson. Oh, no. Yeah. He liked getting his private massages. Oh, okay. Oh, well. no. And then, like, 20 of those private masseuses alleged that he would force them to do other things. Oh. Um, nothing hardcore criminal, but certainly it's sketchy. Fucking gross. And so he was out of the league for a year. And then when he came back, they Cleveland Browns rewarded him. And he's not, he's good. He's not that good. They rewarded him with the richest contract in NFL history when he signed it. And uh, they're as long as they're shackled with him, I don't think they're going to do much, to be honest. Anyway, all right, what's next? From Seconds from Disaster, I finally watched Gran Turismo, and I really liked it. I did, too. It was cool how they showed the different gameplay views and had a pretty good overall story. Did they show that to us at CinemaCon? Yes, it is. Is that where we, we saw, saw it? We saw a trailer when we were there. Oh, that's right. They just showed oh, no, a trailer no, for we, it. Yeah, we, we saw it. an early screening of it, though, afterwards. I Listen, I was very pleasantly, very surprised by how much I enjoyed Gran Turismo. It, it was, it was, it it had great thrills. I liked the story. The girlfriend's storyline shouldn't have even been in the movie. No. I'm sure she's a wonderful person in real life. I'm just saying it didn't work well in the movie, but it was much better than it should have been. And I'm glad you enjoyed it because I liked it too. All right, what's next? From Culture Wars Diplomacy, watching House of Ninja, another ninja series I loved, was Tenshu Ninja of Justice. I can't find it in the States anymore, but it was cute. I tell you what, though, the great thing about that House of Ninjas trailer, did you see that trailer, Chris? Mm-mm. It's the, it's the it Netflix really good. series it's coming fun? up. Okay. Yeah. Was, you understand, as a it's kid growing up, I loved ninja movies. Oh, okay. And the guy, the poster on my wall, besides all the Star Wars and Transformers stuff, was Shokasagi. And I would eat up those ninja movies, man. And this House of Ninjas trailer gave me Shokasagi vibes. And that's what really got me excited. Not as excited as Rob, but I got quite, quite excited about it. All right, what's next? From Josh Carlos, Wall Street Journal reporting Peacock plus Paramount merger in talks. Um, I saw that. Nobody's confirmed that. But it is whispers. They are partners in Europe. But, yeah, that's yeah. the thing. They've they've already done some partner up stuff, and it could be like even if there is some truth to this, it might just be not merging but partnerships. But we'll have to wait and see. Clearly, Paramount is looking for a suitor to either buy them. There've been a lot of organizations and people come forward saying they're making bids to buy Paramount. Paramount may go in a completely different direction, but uh, that could be one to keep an eye on. All right, what's next? 
From Josh Carl. Oh, sorry. From Donut Head. Hey, John. <laughs> as a Canadian, was the NFL popular where you lived? And do you think that the NFL would benefit from a Canadian team? Um, like where I lived in the greater Toronto area, Toronto Hamilton corridor there. Uh, yeah, the NFL is quite popular. Uh, it's very popular in Canada. As a matter of fact, they went and played a couple of games uh, in Toronto at one point. It's tricky, though, because you've got the CFL, the Canadian Football League, which while the NFL, hear this, let me be very clear, the NFL is obviously a much better league, okay? Yes. The CFL is a better game. The CFL has some rule differences that I think the and the NFL will never do, but I think would really open up the NFL game. For for example, the CFL, uh, I don't know if you knew this, Ray, but the CFL field mm -hmm. is longer than the NFL field. Oh, dang. Um, they <laughs> have a 55-yard line. The <laughs> center of the field is 55 yards, so you got five more yards on each side, plus the end zone is 20 yards deep, not 10 yards deep. So you got a much bigger end zone. Um, also, so you got a wider field and a longer field, which really opens up the offense, right? It makes for a more dynamic game. It's like a soccer field. Also, Huge. in the CFL, Pitch. you don't have four downs. You have three downs, which means you have to play, your offense has to play a more wide open style of offense. Also, no fair catch rule. Oh, you have to do it. No fair catch rule which I kind of like that. Um, and, and a number of, of other rule differences. I actually think that the NFL would benefit greatly from. So clearly the NFL is the better league, the more that's where the best players play, all that kind of stuff. But I think there are a lot of things about the CFL game that they would benefit from a lot. Anyway. All right. What's next? Uh, let's see. We did that. So we're mm -hmm. on the members from Yosef Vargas. You guys have to try finding Jacob on Apple plus with Chris Evans. It's amazing. Oh, it's a really good series. I've heard nothing but good things, but you did watch it. Yeah. It and was you enjoyed fabulous. It? It's really, really good. I'll tell well you what, done. Apple plus seems to be killing it. They have have great you shows. started watching masters of the air on Apple? No, plus? I'm planning to this weekend. I'm hearing mixed things about it. Really? Yeah. Okay. Most people I've talked to have said it's really okay, engaging. I, I, and really I've cool. had some people writing and saying that it's not so good, but I haven't seen it yet myself. So I'm, I'm wrapping up lessons in chemistry and then that's going to be my next one. I've heard that surprisingly good. Fabulous series. Is it? Yes, yeah. really good. All right, what's next? From Patrick Reese, if I'm interested in talking about movies myself and sharing my thoughts, would you suggest starting with a blog of some kind or just jumping right into videos? Whatever you're more comfortable with. The, here's the good thing about starting with blogs. It'll train you to articulate, right? Because, and, and it'll train you to prep what you're yeah. going to say. Too many people who start out on YouTube just think you just turn on a camera and start going. And you can tell those ones. You can tell. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and they don't, <laughs> they don't Ray. prepare. Right? <laughs> now, clearly, I don't have a script I'm reading from. But, like, we spend hours preparing for topics. Yeah. And we also have a shorthand here. Yeah, we also have quite quite a good shorthand around here. But writing blogs, like that's how I started. I started with writing the movie blog, right? Blogs will help you get into the habit of preparing and articulating and structuring. And then that way when you go into videos, hopefully you bring those habits over as well. So look, it's whatever you're really comfortable with. But I would kind of recommend maybe starting with writing blogs because it'll just instill some good habits, I think. So uh, try that out. All right, what's next? From Patch Grease again. I also rewatched my favorite movie, Boyhood, and I don't know why I like it as much as I do. Do you have a movie you really like, but you have a hard time explaining why or understanding why yourself? Several. I, I know I've had that conversation with people about there's a particular movie that I really, really, really like, but and I'm not really 100% sure why. It's hard for me to pull it off off the top of my head, but I know I've had several of those. Boyhood, I mean, that's they're going to teach film classes about boyhood because mm -hmm. how many years did he spend making that nine nine Isn't years he? making that movie or what's it 12 Let me it might have been longer than that yeah, yeah like he literally followed this kid as he grew up it was like a super long long process but um yeah it's a special film and it got some a bunch of oscar calls for it too 12, 12 years there you go all right what's next from Carmela Smith, John on Instagram, Cineplex is talking about Dune Popcorn Box and what you could do, use it for. What? <laughs> uh, you know, for a long time, 
for those of you who are friends in, in Canada or any of you who are watching who work with Cineplex, for a long time, when I was at AMC, my actual goal was to leave AMC and go and build what I built for AMC with Cineplex in Canada. It was my dream because that's the, that was my movie theater that I grew up watching movies in was, was Cineplex. I mean, it was called Famous Players before that, but then they evolved. Anyway, and it was always my dream to go and build something for Cineplex. Then they became a really crappy movie theater chain, uh, just with really, really bad practices, very anti-consumer kind of stuff that they did. And I became much less of a fan of theirs, even though they're still the movie theater I go to when I visit Canada. Uh, but I, the last time I went, they actually were better. And I don't know, maybe it can be my dream again, even if I can just work with them for one week so I can say when I retire, I did work with Cineplex. I don't know. We'll see. All right, what's next? From CJ Rebirth, I saw the first episode of the live-action Avatar The Last Airbender last night. What? And it was so awesome. Yeah, there's some people who did. Has a spirit of really? the original. The cast that I saw so far killed it, and I'm super excited to see the rest of the episodes. How? Where? What? Yeah, yeah Ray, it, you, you huh. heard of other people? They did some kind of allowed people to view it last uh, night? I don't know where, but I I saw some people posting their reactions to the first episode. Now, when does, when does the show officially 20... launch? Because it's within the next couple of weeks, yeah, right? It should be nice. Actually, let me look it up. Listen, I, I've said for a long time, I've got a lot of belief in this show because net while Netflix doesn't have a great track record with their original movies. Twenty second. Twenty second? So like in a week. Yeah. Apparently the screens were in Los Angeles, according to Oh Kelly. nice. Uh, um, but I have had a lot of belief in this because while they don't make the best original films, their winning percentage of their original television programming is pretty damn high. Like, they do a pretty damn good job with their series. Some of the best television series that we've had in the last 10 years has been Netflix stuff. So I've had a lot of belief in it. So I'm glad to hear you liked it, man. I'm going to have to go look up some of the other uh, reactions to it. All right, what's next? From Dominic Suma, I love James Gunn, but he's playing with fire being so transparent on Twitter. If he keeps it up, I think it's inevitable he'll say something he regrets. No, nah, he won't. He, like, obviously, he, he had an experience. Clearly, we all know what we're talking about. He had an experience online and he will never make that mistake again. I, I mean, the best lessons are the ones you learn in fire. And he learned his lessons in, in the fire. So he now nah, he'll he'll be fine. He'll be totally fine. He's he's actually very reserved when talking about stuff, right? And you notice he doesn't write long diatribes on so he keeps it very short. I'm sure he's probably got a social media person that he runs his stuff through. Um, so I, I think he'll be okay. He'll be all right. All right, what's next? From Michael Gonzalez, the first two episodes of The Dynasty, New England Patriots, dropped last night on Apple TV, and it's really good. Yeah, I got to check that out. I mean, so one of the great sports stories of the last 30 years or so is is the, the New England Patriot Dynasty. Um, so I got to watch that. I really do. All right, what's next? From Black Adder, hi, John and crew. Not to take away from the success first trailer uh, for the success of the first trailer for Deadpool 3, but also the reason why the numbers are so high is because they counted also 120 million people watching Super Bowl 32nd spot. What's your opinion? Should it be counted as regular trailer views? Every every single trailer, when Endgame got played, when the Endgame trailer got played with a uh, Sunday night football game, whenever, that all they all count. All those movies, those count. And here's the thing about Deadpool. There were a bunch of people that specifically watched the Super Bowl to see the Deadpool trailer. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can ask, okay, yeah, the Super Bowl had a lot of people watching, but how many people were just there to see the trailers? How many people were just there to see Deadpool? So that is true of every single one of those things. So when Spider-Man No Way Home dropped its trailer, its first teaser, that counts towards the whatever. When Captain or Falcon the Winter Soldier uh, broke a bunch of records for for trailers for a television series that was playing during a Monday night football game or a Sunday night football game, one of the two. So those all count. And so every single one of the movies you see in that list benefited from that in some way, shape or form. Uh, and, and again, for the, listen, I, there were so many memes going around the day of, and the day of, and the day before the Super Bowl of who's ready for Deadpool three trailer day. Oh, and some kind of football games going on. Actually, I posted that myself too. So, it 100% counts because it counts for all the other ones as well. All right, what's next? From Matt says, hello. Now that the Fantastic Four cast has been announced, how long before fans start asking to see a trailer? My guess is tomorrow. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. The, the questions about yeah. when are we going to get a trailer are going to start coming fast and furious. You bet your ass they will. All right, last question of the day. What's next? From Ariel. So now that the Fantastic Four casting is out, do you think Anya Taylor-Joy will be in the Fantastic Four? In some <laughs> way. she's The joke is she's been a lot, uh, and all of a sudden, like, the Dune premiere comes out, Anya Taylor-Joy shows up at the premiere, and they're like, and then everybody coming out is like, oh, yeah, Anya Taylor-Joy's in this movie. They totally kept it hidden and under wraps. So now the question is, you think Anya Taylor-Joy will be in Fantastic <laughs> Four? Never know. Yeah. Maybe. You know, I think this is the first time we're going to see a movie. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the first time that we see kind of the two young actresses who are kind of dominating the landscape right now, which is Florence Pugh and Anya Taylor-Joy, and they're going to be in the same movie together. I don't know that they've ever been in the same thing before. So it's going to be really interesting to see that. And all right, guys, with that down, that'll do it for today's installment. Well, this week's installment of the John Campy Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here and making this little show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in topics and questions. Number one, because you gave us fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the show, thank you guys so very much for your support. Don't forget to come on back and join us again next week for a new week of the John Campy Show. I want to thank the people in the room with me, Ray Ora. Uh, Have a good weekend, everyone. Jonathan Voiko. See ya. Chris Carr. I'm going to get so drunk at Madam Web. (laughs) (laughs) I can't wait to hear your reactions for it. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.